welcome to the stage former Fox News hosts, political consultants, and the founders of Lift Our Voices, Gretchen Carlson and Julie Roginski. First of all, I have to say, on behalf of everybody in this room, thank you both for what you have done, truly. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll just sort of start with, you know, we're facing an epidemic right now of toxic workplace culture, and really there are millions of survivors who are being forced into silence. Like, when did this start? Well, you played the Anita Hill clip uh, before we came out here, and ironically, as a journalist, that was the first story that I ever covered. Um, I had no idea that would be my fate uh, in the end, and that I would hearken back to that moment in my own mind about how the hell did this all start? But I really believe that when uh, companies heard Anita Hill and her testimony, they did two things. They said to themselves, oh my gosh, we have to start recognizing what sexual harassment in the workplace is, and we have to provide training and educate our workers. But at the same time, I think that they also said to themselves, oh my God, we cannot have an Anita Hill at our workplace. So we have to figure out a way to silence all these people. And that was really the beginning of the pervasive use of forced arbitration clauses, which we'll explain, <laughs> and non-disclosure agreements. To put it in perspective, in 1991, only 2% of all American workers were subjected to forced arbitration in their workplace contracts. As you mentioned in our introduction, by next year, actually this year now that we're in 2024, 84% of us. That's how much this has just become a pervasive epidemic. It's, un it's unbelievable. The, it's staggering. Uh, Julie, I know when we met at Circle, uh, we talked a little bit of digging into systems that need to be dismantled. And you said that the NDA and forced arbitration are the silver bullet to female equity in the workplace. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, look, if your employees, employers are silencing you, about sexual harassment or gender discrimination or racial discrimination, what else are they not telling you? They may not be telling you that the white guy sitting in the cubicle next to you is getting paid exponentially more for the same job that he's doing that you're doing. And so if Gretchen and I could not turn to each other, if we work together and to say, hey, what are you getting paid versus what am I getting paid because we're both banned by an NDA, guess what? We're never gonna find out that we're not getting paid our worth. Yeah. And to, to Tobin's previous, to the previous panel, I mean, these are all things that we need to talk about because if we don't talk about it, you'll never have those shouts of equal pay anywhere. And so for us, if you're able to talk about these issues openly, honestly, with your colleagues, with your coworkers, with your loved ones, uh, chances are you're gonna be able to address them much more than we're addressing them now. Now we're just sweeping them under the rugs. I mean, look, if somebody were to harass you at work and you have an NDA, you can't tell anybody about it. Yes. I mean, thanks to our law, actually, now you can. But if somebody's racially <laughs> discriminating against you now or discriminating against you for gender or other issues, um, you can't talk about it. Yeah. And if you can't talk about it, you can't do anything about it. And you can't warn other you people. You can't warn other people. You can't do yeah. anything about it. And so that's what we want to do. We want to kind of break open the cob cobwebs here and let people actually be able to discuss these things openly with each other without fear of being sued into oblivion. And I really find this really interesting. You know, makers, the core DNA is telling women stories. And I think about this a lot, which is if we, as a generation, have been able to look at the women who came before us, you know, what is this doing to our ability to share experiences with the generation that's coming after us if none of us really are allowed to speak? I mean, there's so many legal ramifications of this. You know, whenever we watch Law & Order or any of those shows, we always know that they refer back to case law, right? They say, well, we're going to argue this case this way because in 1975, this happened. Well, when everyone is put into forced arbitration instead of an open jury process, forced arbitration, by the way, is this little secret chamber where you go over and adjudicate your claims and nobody ever knows about it. It's secret. So the predators get to keep working because nobody knows, and you go to this secret chamber, likely are fired, and only 2% of the time do complainants win in arbitration. 2%. So this is what's happening to all these claims, right? And there's no legal precedent being, um, being learned over time. So we've lost like 40 years of cases. Mm -hmm. So to our younger generation, we have 
We have nothing to say to them about where we are in the workplace with regard to owning your own voice and the things that are still happening to protected classes. Yeah. This is why this is so paramount to us to make sure that we get those voices back. You know, the irony is Julie and I don't own our own stories. Crazy. We do not own our own truths. There's been movies made about us. There's been miniseries made about us. In fact, I was in this exact room at the Golden Globes, <laughs> but I can't tell my own story. That is why we fight so hard to make sure that all of you can own your own stories and that our next generation especially, my daughter, my son, yes. Julie's son, yeah. won't be silenced and that they'll understand to not sign these agreements. And I'll also give you just one really depressing statistic. So forced arbitration mm -hmm. disproportionately affects women, specifically women of color, specifically women of color making $13 or less an hour. Well, that woman is probably already incredibly disenfranchised in every other part of her life. She gets racially discriminated against hypothetically at work. She wants to say something about it. She goes to her boss, she goes to HR, and she says, so-and-so said something really offensive to me or did something really awful to me. What is gonna happen is you're gonna be shoved into arbitration because chances are she's got an arbitration clause. Only 2% of all cases that are bound by arbitration do go to arbitration because lawyers won't take your case. And the reason they won't take your case is because of the 2% that do go to arbitration, only 2.5%. 2.5% result in any kind of financial compensation for the complainant. So if you're that African-American woman cleaning bedpans, which is actually the home health industry is the industry most disproportionately affected by this, and something really awful happens to you, you don't even want to talk to anybody about it because nothing good's going to happen to you. Statistically, you're not going to see any kind of justice. So you're not going to talk to your daughter or your son or anybody else about it because what's the point? Mm -hmm. That's the message we're sending. What is the point for that woman to even raise her hand and say, hey, my boss is completely exploiting me, racially discriminating against me, discriminating against me based on my gender. There's no point. And that's what we're teaching our generation, our future generations, if we don't change this, that they better just shut up and take it. We're not gonna, you know, that's why Gretchen and I started this. We're not putting up with that anymore. Yeah. And I hope all of you will agree that you're not putting up with it anymore either. <laughs> You know, the, uh, the other uh, epidemic that's being created by forced arbitration and NDAs is really a mental health epidemic. So, you know, I was speaking with actually a psychologist on this and the number one way for any of you who've been in therapy that you deal with trauma is being able to speak about it. And if you have to carry somebody else's misbehavior, wrongdoing, um, sometimes criminal behavior, um, what does that do? And, and, and why does corporate America not have a responsibility to protect their workers? Yeah, because all this has been shoved into secrecy, so they've never had to have the responsibility for it. But we're just beginning to scratch the surface at our nonprofit, Lift Our Voices, about what the mental health impacts are, because it's very hard to study because people can't tell you they have an NDA, right? So, so how do you find these people to actually begin to ask them what the mental health consequences have been? Yeah. I'll just share from personal story before I decided to come forward seven and a half years ago at Fox News and jump off the cliff by myself, that one of the things that helped my mental health uh, was the ability for me to, number one, tell my parents what I was about to do and get their full support. We never get too old for that, right? And also that I found out from my lawyers that I could go to my minister and tell her. Oh. And for whatever reason, that gave me so much power because I could at least get it off my chest and say to somebody outside of my family, this is what I'm thinking I'm about to do and, and what do you think about it? And, not to get too mushy, but my grandfather had been a minister and he had since passed away. And she said to me then, you know, he's looking down, he's telling you to do it. Wow. And so the mental health for me in that personal story is what propelled me to jump. Now, if you can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, what are the repercussions? We haven't even begun to understand how many wounded people are out there 
carrying around these experiences and not being able to get them out. And by the way, it's not a two-way street. While you can't say anything, your employer can say whatever he or she wants about you. So somebody could be completely <laughs> misconstruing the events of your departure, the events of the reason, you know, everything about your life. And you have to sit there and not say a word. Think about mentally what that does to somebody. I mean, you know, <laughs> the whole notion after 9-11, if you see something, say something. You can't say anything. Yeah. And so you're, it's building up, it's building up, it's building up, and you have to keep tamping it down and tamping it down. It's brutal mentally. And Gretchen and I counsel, I don't know how many women on a, on a weekly basis who just call us for advice. They feel they can talk to us because they know we're not gonna wrap them out, but they're really violating their NDAs by doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's awful that they have to confide in strangers because they can't confide in anybody else because they know that if they were ever busted, they could be in court and, and sued into oblivion. Well, a lot of these yeah. NDAs have huge penalty clauses right. in them, Yes. right? So I'm just gonna hypothetically make this up, mm -hmm. but hundreds and thousands of dollars for one infraction. So if you like did an interview with a newspaper and you said five things that violated your NDA, each one would be an infraction. So they scare you into oblivion as well. Um, so it's just, it's, it's incredibly important to understand when you sign a new workplace contract or even just look at your handbook or happen to click on an email, you may be agreeing to these policies. And the reason our education is so important is because people don't care about this until it happens to them and then it's too late. You've already signed these agreements and you go to HR and they go, Phew, no one will ever know about this because you have a forced arbitration clause and you have an NDA and we're gonna continue hiding all this bad stuff. Yeah. And this was originally meant, right? NDAs were originally meant to protect, you know, Pepsi versus Coke trade yeah, secrets. Yeah, of course, we believe in that. Right. Yes. Yeah. yes. You so, should be able to protect your trade secrets at work. Correct. And there is this really interesting sort of, you know, silent dynamic that happens as well. And I think that you're uh, sort of touching on that is that even though that you're not allowed to speak out, um, it is very easy for an employer at the top, right, to uh, prevent you from getting other work and tarnish your reputation. Mm -hmm. A hundred percent. And the problem with that is you can't respond, right? You can't respond. You can't respond. So Well, I'd love to actually yeah. respond to that question I know about what happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't. Right. You know, so his, and Julie yes. and I have to, when we do interviews like this, well, first of all, women's brains have to work quicker than everyone else's, right? But but we actually have to do triple time in our brains when we do these interviews because we have to determine live on a stage or live on television, am I violating my NDA? And by the way, we're not lawyers, so think about that, right? Like, well, we're half that. lawyers. Yeah, we pretty much are by now, but we are technically not lawyers. So the fact that we have to sit there and legally think, well, clause X of my contract, of my settlement says I can't talk about this, but I can kind of allude to this, like, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's exhausting. And we do this for a living, not for a living, we don't make any money, but we do this as our full-time, non-paid jobs all the time. Imagine if you're that woman that I just spoke about. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not worth it. Yeah. You just shut up. You don't want to, you know, you just want to move on. And sometimes you're not allowed to move on because sometimes the other side of the story is presented in ways that you can't respond to. And that makes it very difficult as well. Yeah, as leaders, I mean, many leaders here uh, in the room today, um, you know, when you talk again about a younger generation and even protecting people on your team, respective team, I know, Julie, you brought up an incident. I don't know if you're able to talk about it where you weren't able to yeah, protect someone. Yeah, so this, someone. Is, this is actually a really devastating story. I had two NDAs in my life. One was with Fox News, which I can't talk to you guys about because I'm still banned by it. One was actually with the governor of New Jersey, Governor Murphy. Um, I had been his political consultant and I had signed a very long contract. Buried in this contract was an incredibly onerous NDA that prevented me from talking about, and, and I quote, anything that I'd witnessed or experienced at any time whatsoever in perpetuity. So hypothetically, I could- And that's post-death, by the way. By the way, yeah, if I, you're right. Um, and so several years later, I had a young woman come to me who had been a volunteer in the campaign. She called me and she said, do you remember me? And I said, yeah, kind of. And she said, um, I was sexually assaulted by a senior aide to the governor, to Governor Murphy. And I had been getting literally legal threats from his attorneys nonstop reminding me of my obligations under this NDA. I couldn't help her. 
because I had to make a decision in my mind, do I break this NDA and tell her what I know that will absolutely help her case, help her get healing, help her do whatever, and potentially get sued into oblivion by a very, very, very wealthy man? Or do I kind of help her to the best of my ability, but really not help her as well as I could? And it was the dark, literally I keep saying it was the darkest day of my professional career. Um, I fought tooth and nail for many, many, many years to get out of that NDA precisely so I could help women like her. And the reason that I was so passionate about this and the reason Gretchen and I um, got together to do this is because of her, right? Because that woman desperately needed somebody who was much more established in a much more influential position of power to help her. And yet the woman she thought was powerful enough to help her actually had no power at all because she was being silenced through continuous legal threats. The only reason I'm able to tell you the story now, think about how tragic this is. The only reason I'm able to tell you the story now is because I finally got out of that NDA after years upon years and lawyers and expense and, and nonsense. But wait, but that's not, that, I appreciate it, but that's not great, right? Because not everybody has the resources that I do to fight yeah. it. And the but truth it, of the matter is- But it stemmed I, the New Jersey law. But it stemmed the New Jersey law. It stemmed part of our, our federal law that we helped pass called the Speak Out Act that prevents NDAs for sexual harassment and assault, not just for survivors, but for witnesses. I insisted that we get the word witness in there because, <clears throat> excuse me, I did not want to ever be in a position again where I could not help somebody get the kind of justice that they needed. It's amazing. And that's, you know, we need more people to, st but the onus shouldn't be on us, right? The onus shouldn't be on the witnesses, on the survivors. The wit onus really should be on these people not to force these kinds of silencing mechanisms on. But we should say that that story helped propel the legislation that we supported in New Jersey. So New Jersey was the first state to eradicate NDAs for all toxic workplace issues. It's been in effect now for more than four years. So if you work in New Jersey, you cannot be subjected to an NDA, full stop. Then California passed the Silence No More Act. So same thing in California. Then Washington State, which we believe to actually be the best law, because you know as you go along, you learn little loopholes that companies are gonna use. And so Washington State also includes non-disparagement clauses. So that's the pristine law that passed. And we've introduced that same language in New York and about to introduce it in Connecticut. And if we could clone ourselves, we would be introducing it in a lot of other states. But this is a movement that we're in charge of uh, from state to state, or at least supporting, um, that has had massive impact because companies based in those states are now left with a two-tiered system. Some employees that they can't use NDAs with and a bunch of others that they can. So big companies, what have they done? Microsoft, Apple, Google, et cetera, they've decided to take out NDAs for all of their employees, which is what we were hoping would happen, like a domino effect, because they didn't want to have this two-tiered yes. system. So you, know, you think state laws don't have impacts. Well, actually, uh, the state laws we support have had arguably more impact than in changing the system than even the two federal laws that we passed. Wow. And talk a little bit about that. So you co-founded Lift Our Voices. Um, you worked on incredible getting policy, sort of bipartisan, you just said the Speak Up Act. Tell us a little bit you know, about the work that you're doing and where you're, where, where, where you're going. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'll kick it off because I started the advocacy before we formed Lift Our Voices. Right after my story, I started hearing from thousands of survivors. And I realized we had two epidemics in our nation. We had an epidemic of sexual harassment in the workplace still, and we had an epidemic of silencing people. And I decided that I had to do something about that in tribute to all these people who never had a voice. And they all said to me the same thing. Thank you for being the voice for the voiceless. And so it was like a perfect storm. I went to DC and started walking the halls of Congress and there were tons of advocacy groups who had been fighting against forced arbitration for a long time but they didn't really have a, a well-known case to be able to pinpoint how important it was. And then I came into the equation with that part, but I needed their expertise and knowledge, and so we partnered together. And um, it was a five-year slog, but we were able to build a bipartisan coalition on these issues and needed 10 Republicans in the Senate for it to pass. Um, took a long time, but so, so happy to say you saw the photo earlier that uh, two years ago this Saturday, uh, we were th with the President of the United States and he signed this bill into law, meaning that you can no longer force arbitration 
on any person in the workplace who experiences sexual misconduct, the biggest labor law change in the last 100 years. And let me just add, Leslie, that I always say, um, you know, in the most hyper-political time of our generation, passing a bipartisan law huge. is easier than changing culture. Changing culture? You know, you heard in the panel before with Jen, 247 years till we get to pay equity? I mean, it's crazy, right? Changing culture? is almost impossible, but we're relentless. Yeah. So we believe that in passing laws, it forces people to change culture, but we attack this from so many different angles. Passing laws is just one part of it. Education's really important because most people, as, as we saw from the show of hands, most people don't know. I didn't realize what I was signing. Neither, you know, we keep saying we're pretty educated. <laughs> we had pretty high profile jobs at Fox. We were given uh, a settlement agreement, it had an NDA in it. We were told this is just the way of the world, do it. Had we known then what we know now, we never would have signed, never. I mean, it's, n it's not worth it. But that's what we need to explain to people. It's not worth it because you don't own your life, you don't own your story, you don't own your truth. You have the mental health repercussions, as you said, of not being able to discuss it with anybody. Um, but it's about education, it's about ensuring that especially younger, Generations know what they're signing up for. Listen, I'm Generation X. We were not nearly as, as effective in doing anything as this new generation coming up. I mean, I look at these college students every day. I'm in awe, and it's fantastic. And so I hope that they get behind this as well and understand that they don't have to put up with this. One person raising their hand and saying, eh, I really don't want to sign this. Well, that person may not get that job. If everybody says, we're just not putting up with this, so don't even bother. Right. Companies will have no choice. We have to normalize it. Right. Yeah. And you know, I always point to paternity leave as a really good example of how that happened in our culture. So 15 years ago, people frowned you know, yeah. behind, behind your back, right, if you took paternity leave. Now we've normalized it. And how did that happen? More and more men decided to do it. Yeah. Similarly, if we can normalize what we're talking about, where people refuse to sign an employment agreement with a forced arbitration clause or an NDA in it, and it's not just one person, then that will also be a way that we can target this because people will not be able, companies will not be able to hire you in an employee market if you don't want to be silenced. So it's very important for people to start becoming aware of this and asking the questions. So in terms of education, um, can you just talk a little like, you know, I just use the example, right? Because we all feel like, you know, you get a job offer, you have to sign. What, what should people be saying? Like, well, what are the tools that are available? We're working on tools that are very easily available for you to look and scour through your employment contract to see what's in there. But most importantly, you know, you look and you see what your salary is. You, ne you negotiate that. You look and you negotiate what your vacation time is, your benefits. You should also see if your company is putting these silencing mechanisms in. And they masquerade, they're not going to say non-disclosure agreement. It'll be confidentiality provision or, or uh, dispute resolution or any of those things, right? But look for the words that are in them. Because of the word mandatory arbitration, they're never going to say forced, but it's going to say you have to go through arbitration or you have to be, depending on what the confidentiality provision is, if there's a confidentiality provision that prevents you from telling Coca-Cola what the secret formula of Pepsi is, then that's great. You shouldn't be able to do that. But if it says something like mine did, which is nothing at any time whatsoever until death do you part, even after that, maybe that's not a great place to work. Um, but people don't realize that. So I think they need to really scour this. You don't need to be a lawyer to really look for this language if you understand what you're looking for. And that's what we're trying to do. But also, even with our two federal laws that have passed, first of all, they're retroactive. So everyone should understand that. So if you signed a forced arbitration clause 20 years ago and you still work at that same company and you face sexual misconduct, you do not have to go to forced arbitration. Our law takes you out of that. But at the same time, companies can still put arbitration clauses in your contract and not spell out, this does not apply to sexual misconduct, right? So you have to know. And we did a huge Know Your Rights campaign digitally um, that, to try and educate people. As a worker, you have to understand what your rights are. So with our two federal laws, 
you do not have to go to forced arbitration anymore for sexual misconduct. And you own your own voice, thanks to the Speak Out Act. If you sign an NDA on your first day of employment, which one third of all of us do, and something bad happens to you, you now own your voice from that time on until a dispute arises, which is a little squishy, <laughs> but you own your voice for a lot longer than you have in, in the past. Um, what are your hopes for, you know, in terms of policy and the next steps on the policies that you're trying to get so pushed through in, in a room full of resources and what would you like to uh, have everybody here do? Well, first of all, we just introduced legislation um, a little while ago called the Protecting Older Americans Act, because believe it or not, once you hit 40, for the lawyers in the room, you'll know this, um, you can be discriminated against based on gender, which is no, kind of scary. Age, 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 excuse me, age. So it's a, it's a legislation to get rid of um, forced arbitration for age discrimination, and that's the next thing we, that we could get Republicans behind. We need 10 of them in the Senate to overcome the filibuster. Um, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna do race, we're gonna do gender, we're gonna do all protected classes that we can um, until this is done, until this is over. We have to do it one at a time because of the way politics works, but we're not gonna stop until we do that. At the state level, we are going to go to all 50 states if we can't get it done federally and get rid of NDAs because that's not bound by federal legislation the way arbitration is. And um, we're gonna keep at it. And hopefully all of you guys can join us in helping us do that. If you live in a state yeah. where and the NDAs have not already been eradicated, you can reach out to us at liftourvoices.org. And if you want to start a campaign in your state, we'll come and help you. Um, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that our strategy on the federal level, as Julie talked about, was to take a bite out of the apple and get success and come back for more. You know, we as an organization believe in getting rid of arbitration and NDAs for all protected classes, but we knew if we tried to throw that whole thing out in our current political climate, it would never, ever pass, and we would actually get more resentment from certain political people. So our strategy was, let's get the sexual misconduct bill passed into law, and then we can go back to the same bipartisan coalition of people and say, okay, now what's next? And that's how we got to age, and now we're hoping, depending on the makeup of Congress, that we can then start tackling gender, race, et cetera. So this is a, you know, this is a five to 10 year process, but it's certainly quicker than 247 years to get to pay equity. <laughs> um, Julie and Gretchen very graciously put together uh, two whole documents to really, I hope all of you educate yourselves. It is actually on the Makers app. Um, if you can read through it and uh, really understand about NDAs, forced arbitration, and what you can actually do. Thank you so much thank you. for being thank here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for sharing with everyone. And thank you to all of you.